so first correction, I don't own that space. On the New York Times uh, op-ed page, it's sort of, it's actually kind of like uh, the, um, uh, the, the uh, uh, property, uh, property under the Mogul or the Ottoman Empire. You know, you're sort of granted the, the use of the land and, and the tenants in return for, for service. So that's, uh, that's what I've got, and it, it can be removed any day. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Okay, so um, crisis, uh, and obviously this conference is about the crisis and, uh, and its implications. Now, the locus of, of the crisis at the moment seems to have shifted. This is the epicenter. Uh, um, last year, I was telling people, particularly people in, in developing countries that I know, that uh, it was such a relief that in the past when I wanted to visit the heart of, the, of an economic crisis. I had to go off to Buenos Aires or Jakarta. Uh, now I can get there on New Jersey Transit. Um, but um, at this point, actually not. At this point, you actually have to fly across the Atlantic and, and brave the Icelandic volcano to, to get to where the, the action is. Um, it's, it's amazing, uh, Greece, uh, Greece and its implications. The European troubles are now really what everyone is focusing on. Uh, there's actually a... Uh, uh, one, one of the financial sites I, I visit online uh, quite often just has a, an, a, an item on it now every day called uh, the Daily Grease uh, because we're, there's just so much happening around it, which is an interesting question why this has loomed so large. I'm going to talk a little bit about the nature of the Greek crisis and then move on from it. But you know, if it was just Greece, we wouldn't be paying that much attention. Uh, Greece, uh, I was actually checking this out, it's got about the same GDP as Michigan, uh, as the state of Michigan. So if we were looking at, um, at economic impacts, you know, what we can ask ourselves how much would, uh, we'd be asking ourselves how much would we be conserved? How much would, we be, uh, would the world be uh, in an uproar if uh, the economy of Michigan were to implode? And actually, we know the answer to that because it has, and nobody <laughs> sort of noticed. Um, but Greece is setting people ablaze, not because Greece itself is so important, but because of its implications, actual or perceived. Um, perceptions are a big thing here. Um, and one of the things that's happened is that as Greece has gotten into trouble, a number of people have sort of jumped on the Greek crisis, uh, you know, like a fumbled football. They, they want to appropriate uh, this crisis for whatever it is they believe ought to be happening. Uh, so a lot of it's, it's been uh, catnip for the deficit hawks who say this is what happens if you, uh, if you don't slash spending, uh, cure deficits right now. Um, um, more, even more specifically, the people who combine deficit hawkery with uh, um, opposition to a large welfare state have really made Greece a big, a big issue. So they've, they've, they've tried to grab hold of that. Um, I don't buy either of those. I think uh, to understand the Greek thing, the Greek problem, and it's, it's spillover, you have to think of it as being uh, something that's much more specific. It has to do with the special constraints that Greece operates under being a member of the Eurozone and being a member of the Eurozone at this point, uh, which means in, in turn that we're talking about uh, basically a European problem, but that's not trivial because the problems of Greece are not unique to Greece. They're especially bad there, but they are in fact getting at the structural problems of Europe as has been constructed, the fundamental flaws of that construction. And while Greece is per se not important, Europe is. And so that's really why this, this all matters. So what I thought I'd do, uh, before I talk about those broader implications, I thought I'd talk, uh, talk a little bit about Greece and what, what has got everyone so riled up, what, what is and isn't the problem there, and uh, show you a few, a few charts that, that I think uh, are helpful in talking about this. So um, the first thing is to say, is, is this just, this is what happens to you when you have a lot of debt? And it is true that Greece has a lot of debt, but it's not the first country to have this much debt. It's not the first European country to have this much debt. Uh, and others have been remarkably free from anything comparable. So this is just a, a quick uh, pull up from, from Eurostat. This is 
Um, gross government debt is percentage of GDP. Uh, the blue line is Greece, which is uh, certainly 115% of GDP debt is not something that, that you would uh, like to see. And it, it does pose problems. And it, in the case of Greece, it's, it's posing essentially intractable problems. Um, but compare that with, well, Belgium, which in the late 90s actually was slightly further indebted, brought it down quite a lot, but still to levels that are pretty high by historical standards. Um, there has been no Belgian financial crisis. Uh, at the moment, the interest rate on Belgian long-term bonds is 3.36%. Uh, it's about 45 basis points above Germany, barely, uh, uh, barely any risk premium. Um, I always like Belgium as an example of the ability of advanced countries to have quite high levels of debt without a crisis, uh, precisely because uh, Belgium has a inherently weak political situation with the linguistic divide. So actually, if I, uh, it's, it's a different story somewhat, but I, I also often put up Italy uh, in the same, for the same reason, high levels of debt, roughly comparable, actually. Uh, and Belgium is, is weak because, of, politically weak because of the linguistic divide. Italy is politically weak because it's Italy. And, um, the, uh, <laughs> and yet, they've been without serious crisis. Um, so, what's different uh, about, about Greece? Well, if you look at the, what actually happened in terms of uh, uh, Belgium, they, they were able to bring their debt down, make this adjustment during a time of economic expansion. Europe as a whole and, and Belgium as part of that were expanding. Greece has entered into this crisis after a story that has left them in a very difficult situation. Um, now, one of the wonders of the world uh, during the past decade, something that we didn't pay a whole lot of attention to. We were, we were looking, if we were looking at things like international trade, international imbalances, everyone was focused on the United States versus China. But something that was actually bigger relative to the economies involved was the divergence that took place within Europe. So these are current account balances uh, for a selection of Eurozone countries. So current account being the broad definition of the trade balance, including services and, and interest payments. Um, the purple line at the top there is Germany moving into vast surplus. Germany basically becoming an economy that, that is totally dependent upon running huge trade surpluses in order to maintain anything like full employment. Um, actually, the next one up there is the Netherlands, which is uh, a smaller number, but also a much smaller country. And although we, we are spending a lot of time um, talking about the, depending on where you come from, but on my side of things, talking about the, the evils of, of German surpluses, um, the truth is that uh, relative to the size of the economy, the Dutch are the real villains. So uh, Austin Powers' father was right uh, if, you went instead, if you saw that the really bad third movie there. Um, the, uh, uh, and on the other hand, you have the emergence of large deficits um, in the rest. Uh, leaving, a, I, I hate the, uh, the pigs uh, as an acronym, you know, people of, uh, I, I think it's, I, actually, if, if I were going to say, I would say that the, what we're seeing right now is a crisis of the, the cohesion countries. Um, so in, in, Euro, in Eurospeak, uh, there's cohesion and there's convergence, and each of them means the opposite of what you think it should. So, uh, so uh, uh, cohesion is, is converging on in per capita incomes, and, and, uh, and convergence is, is achieving the prerequisites for monetary cohesion. But anyway, the, uh, um, the countries that were receiving cohesion funds, the countries that came into the European Union relatively poor and received a fair bit of aid, uh, it's Portugal, Spain, Greece, and, and Ireland. Uh, all of those countries moved into massive current account deficit, which is the flip side of saying that they all received massive inflows of capital uh, during the past decade. Lots of money flowed in, pretty clearly flowed in because with the formation of the euro, people began to think they were safe, there were no problems, all the old risks were gone, um, as the, there's wonderful book by by Ken Rogoff and, and Carmen Reinhardt, uh, uh, titled This Time is Different, 
uh, about the history of financial crises, which in fact are all the same. Uh, and so the this time is different syndrome applied very strongly within Europe, uh, which led to these big capital inflows. Um, actually, here's a picture. This is the uh, uh, see convergence and cohesion. So the convergence, this is the, the uh, long-term interest rates that were part of the criterion for joining the euro. And it shows Greece and Germany, and before the euro came along, Greek interest rates were much higher than German. People were demanding a substantial risk premium. Um, with the formation of the euro, virtually the same. People basically said a euro bond is a euro bond, wherever it comes from, and that meant a big reduction in interest rates in Greece, meant large capital inflows. Uh, of course, now they've uh, diverged again, and at this point, uh, the spread between Greek and German bonds is about what it was in the late 90s. So we're actually back, back in some ways, just back to, to the way things used to be. Um, but um, this is, the, the, the reason all of this matters is that during this period, during the good time, during the time when, when capital was cheap in the cohesion countries, um, they ran higher inflation than the, uh, than the surplus countries. They ran they had larger wage increases, higher price increases, became uncompetitive which was not a problem for employment because lots of jobs were being created in, in things that were being fed by cheap capital. Uh, in Spain especially, the uh, gigantic, gigantic uh, real estate bubble. Um, but once the music stopped, once the money stopped flowing in, you're left with an overvalued currency, except you don't have a currency, but you're left with, with costs and prices that are out of line with the rest of Europe, which makes it very, which basically is a recipe for high unemployment for a depressed economy, and also because you have a depressed economy for a sudden surge in budget deficits. Um, and the place where the pressure gets felt is people not being willing to, uh, to finance those budget deficits. But in, the, in a sense, the underlying problem is this overvaluation. Um, if Greece still had its own currency, what it would do is devalue. Now that might, might not solve the debt problem. Uh, so you might imagine that, that Greece would actually end up uh, restructuring its debt at plus devaluation, which would restore its competitiveness, and then it would have a recovery. Uh, but it doesn't actually have, at the moment, um, even restructuring the debt doesn't buy them that much. Uh, at the moment, actually I'll show you a, uh, some figures in a second, but if Greece completely stopped paying its debt, pay, stopped paying interest uh, at all, stopped uh, repaying principal, it would still find itself with a dr drastic, drastic fiscal adjustment required. Uh, so that by itself wouldn't help. In order to actually get an re economic recovery, it would have to do something to get its costs back in line, which would require a devaluation. Um, but of course, Greece doesn't have its own currency. It's, uh, it's part of the Eurozone. So it's operating on uh, a single currency. Um, you might say, well, maybe it's time to bring back the drachma. That's, that's one hell of a thing to do. Uh, if you even suggested the possibility, um, then there would be massive runs on Greek banks. And it would be a, a pretty much catastrophic scenario. Um, until about a month ago, I was with those who said, this makes it impossible to leave the euro. The euro is a permanent feature of life. It cannot go away. Um, I've now, as the situation worsened, realized that there is a possible way this can happen which is that no government can, can say we're going to leave the euro because to do so would start massive bank runs. But if the massive bank runs come first, then you close the banks temporarily and then you can leave the euro. Uh, which is not entirely hypothetical actually if, you're, if you follow these things. If you, if you followed Argentina, Argentina spent most of the, uh, uh, spent most of the 90s and, and up to the end of 2001 with a, a fixed parity one peso one dollar and the convertibility law, which said it's going to be one peso, one dollar, which you couldn't change and, uh, without changing the law. And the, the argument was pretty much the same. To even discuss changing the law would need to set off a massive bank run, so you can't, uh, you can't this is actually a permanent uh, arrangement. But what actually happened in the end was the massive bank runs happened anyway, uh, and were met with what amounted to a, 
a kind of bank holiday, the, the Carlito, which said there was very little sharp limits on withdrawals from banks. At that point, it became possible to actually end the parity. I'd say there's maybe a 50-50 chance that something like this will eventually end up happening in Greece. So it, this, is, this is very serious stuff. Um, nobody wants to talk about that. In fact, politically, you cannot talk about it. Uh, there's simply no way that, that any significant figure on the European scene can, can be seen to be so much as considering the possibility of a breakup of the euro. So what we have instead is the attempt to, to manage this, which is a combination of very large scale funding for the Greek government from other European governments so that they don't have to go back to the markets for, for borrowing, which helps because at, at the interest rates that the market was demanding, it would have been impossible. It would have been a, a death spiral of debt. Um, plus, incredibly fierce, harsh, painful austerity. Uh, austerity on the budget and the expectation that you'll have years and years of economic stagnation and high unemployment. Um, so if you take a look at what the program agreed with the IMF looks like, and I realize I didn't have the years, but in fact the columns there are 2009, 2010, uh, and so on up to uh, 2015. Um, just uh, the, that first line just gives you an idea of, of how much the trade adjustment is. Uh, where the, the actual figure for last year was a, a current account, that basically a trade deficit of 11% of, of GDP. So you know, for the U.S., the equivalent of, of uh, uh, a $1.5 trillion uh, trade deficit, um, the, um, which is supposed to go to near balance uh, by 2015. Uh, but the main thing is to look at the, the public finances. Um, Greece is supposed to go from a deficit of almost 14% of GDP to just about 2 the primary balance, that's not counting interest payments, so that's the second line from the bottom, it's supposed to go from huge deficit last year to, uh, to huge surplus. And by the way, there's my why repudiating the debt wouldn't actually help that much. Last year, if they stopped paying all interest, they'd still have 9% of GDP adjustment required. So it, it's, it's really awful. But, but what's being expected of them in this plan is, is almost 15% of GDP adjustment. That's, right, that's, uh, um, and, and most of that, almost none of that is coming from the expectation that they will grow, that the economy will grow and that revenues will increase. There's basically none of that in there. The line that's called measures is the austerity measures that they've agreed to do with the IMF and with the rest of the Europeans. Um, accumulating to 12% of GDP in spending cuts and tax increases. Again, that's, uh, that's more, for, put in U.S. perspective, that's more than completely eliminating Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid combined. Right? There's gigantic levels of austerity. Um, I find it hard to believe that this is going to happen. It is, it is hard to believe, although uh, the alternatives are terrible, too. So it is, it is really hard to see. Uh, but that's, that gives you a sense of just how severe. Oh, and, and what we achieved through all of that is that um, debt as a share of GDP, which is 115% right now, will within five years be 140%. Uh, how, the, you ask, how can that happen with all of that austerity? And the answer is no growth. Uh, no economic growth and, uh, and uh, the the, the program calls for essentially no inflation. I actually think in reality we'd be looking at substantial deflation. So the, the euro value of, of Greek GDP falls. And, uh, and even though they don't borrow very much, the debt situation gets worse. So it's uh, awesome. Right? This, is, this is what is now considered to be a responsible solution to the problem. Uh, it gives you an idea of just how bad things are. And as I say, I mean, I, my guess is that in, in the end it will, it, Euro exit will be how it, Euro exit plus de debt restructuring, but um, uh, certainly debt restructuring, possibly Euro exit. Anyway, it's, it's, it's a mess. Okay, so what does all this say? 
Um, obviously, it's terrible for Greece. Uh, it's bad, though not as bad, uh, for the other cohesion countries. Uh, the um, uh, markets are acting as if they are reasonably confident that the, uh, that the uh, Portuguese and the Spaniards will in fact do something like this, although a milder version. Markets are acting as if, as if they are, their pledge to be austere and, and do the adjustment is, is, is actually plausible. I, I am, am less convinced of that than the markets for sure, but, uh, but something like this possibly. Um, but it's clear that, that we've got a, a terrible, terrible mess here. Um, think about the fact that we're not talking about um, we're not talking about countries that have you know, suffered a natural disaster. There hasn't been any uh, hurricane. Uh, uh, Icelandic ash is not in these numbers. Uh, the, we're not talking about something that has actually reduced their, their productive capacity. Uh, there's a lot of talk about structural reform. But the truth is that it's not clear that there was anything, certainly for Spain, that there was anything terribly wrong structurally with their economy. Yes, I mean, sure, there, there, were, there were rigidities, there were things that, that could be done better, but, but Spain didn't look like that bad a case before the crisis hit. Um, it's, uh, it was actually running budget surpluses. It was, uh, it had fairly high measured unemployment, but it didn't feel like a high unemployment country. Uh, now, all of a sudden, they're faced with the prospect of years and years of massive, massive unemployment, extremely hard adjustment, and all of it because people are stuck uh, with, with the euro. They, they, we have a common currency which has, was supposed to bring great things and certainly has led to convenience, certainly made it easier to do business across national boundaries, but turns out in this crisis to place countries in the situation of having a extremely, uh, almost impossible uh, problem of adjustment. Um, many people, many economists have made the comparison between the, the role of the euro within Europe now and, and the role of the gold standard in the early years of the Great Depression, where the, uh, where, where the commitment, which was believed to be absolutely essential to a fixed value of your currency in terms of gold, was a major factor in propagating the depression and causing it to persist. Uh, the difference is it's, it's actually much harder to go off the euro than to go off the gold standard. So the, uh, the golden fetters this time are, are, are actually much, uh, golden fetters was, was King's phrase for the gold standard. The golden fetters here are actually much more binding than, than the ones of the 1930s. Um, how, did they, how did this happen? Uh, we make this mistake. We say nobody, nobody could have imagined, um, which, uh, 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 no, nobody could have predicted, if you follow certain, um, uh, certain <laughs> discussions, that's become a, a, a standard, uh, it's become a standard sarcastic phrase. You know, nobody could have predicted, nobody could have predicted the housing bust. Uh, nobody could have predicted uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the trouble in Iraq, whereas in fact, of course, lots of people could and did. Um, in this case, um, what's happening to the Eurozone is pretty much what Eurosceptics were worried about from the beginning, although I think it's the, the severity of the crisis is worse than anyone really imagined. Um, the, the problem, okay, a little bit of economics, most people here probably know, but anyway, the, the, there's, a, there's an old literature of, about uh, uh, when, when do countries constitute an, an optimum currency area? When does it make sense to share a single money? So it's a literature that goes back to the 1950s. Our own Peter Kennan here, one of the major contributors. Um, basically, and, and the, the way it was phrased was, look, the United States is a continent-sized economy that has just one money, seems to manage. So why can't Europe, which is actually physically quite a lot smaller, why can't Europe do the same thing? Um, and the answer from the Eurosceptics was, look, there are a couple of important things that the United States has that Europe does not have. Uh, the United States has extremely high labor mobility, so that when there's a boom in one part of the U.S., wages in that region don't go up all that much. Instead, people move in, and when the boom turns to a bust, uh, people move out. 
So that if you look, you know, Massachusetts, the example I always like to use, because I lived there at the time, Massachusetts had a great boom in the, in the 1980s, and then a spectacular bust. Um, and never really recovered. The Massachusetts share of US employment never recovered from the lows it hit after the bust there. But the unemployment rate went back down to the national average because people moved. Uh, doesn't happen in Europe. There is, uh, in principle, there's free mobility of labor now, but it's, in practice, uh, there's the cultural differences and, of course, language differences. So Europe doesn't really have that. But even more important in the current situation um, is the lack of fiscal integration. Um, California is a mess. California, I don't think California will default on its debt because it doesn't have very much debt. Uh, so it, there's not much point. But, uh, but California is being forced into austerity that is comparable and it's savagery to the, what the Greeks are being uh, forced to do. But it's on a much smaller base because most government spending in California comes from Washington, not from Sacramento. Most of it is the Social Security checks, the Medicare checks are, will continue to come regardless of what Schwarzenegger and the legislature do. And that means that, that we have a lot more ability to roll with these things. Uh, estimates suggest that when a U.S. state suffers an idiosyncratic recession, um, that uh, uh, aid from the federal government, we don't call it that, but de facto aid from the federal government in the form of Social Security checks that keep on coming even though payroll tax receipts have gone down and Medicare keeps on paying even though Medicare payments have gone down and, and unemployment benefits are paid in part from Washington, that aid offsets something like 40% of the decline in GDP. So that we have a, an automatic aid mechanism on a scale that despite everything that the Europeans are trying to do now, uh, dwarfs anything that, that's possible in, inside Europe. Um, in short, it kind of looks like uh, Europe wasn't really ready for this single currency. They created this thing as a political symbol, in part. In part, they created it as a way to sort of force greater political integration. The idea was that once you have the single currency, actually crises will make you stronger because Europe would have to respond to the crises by enhancing the, the European institutions. Um, but that's starting to look like uh, more than, they, than you can do. And uh, um, I use this in the column, but it is, is actually a joke that, that we were telling back in in 1992, uh, when the Maastricht Treaty was, was signed, that they, they picked the wrong Dutch city, that they should have uh, done it in, in Arnhem, uh, which, if you know your World War II history, is the site of the famous Bridge Too Far, an overambitious Allied offensive that, that, that turned into a disaster. And it kind of looks like that for Europe. Um, one more thing. Um, Europe has a central bank. This is an experiment to have a central bank and a single money without a single government behind it. Uh, uh, decentralized fiscal policy, centralized monetary policy. How well is that going to work? Um, and it turns out that there are pitfalls in that that go beyond anything that even the skeptics were thinking about. Because no one really anticipated, this I can say, this, this no one could have predicted. Maybe we should have, but no one did predict. Um, that you would enter a situation where monetary policy really has to be done through aggressive, unconventional measures, where interest, the, the normal thing, cutting, cutting interest rates, has run out of room because interest rates are effectively zero. Um, so you really need to have the central bank do other stuff, uh, like buying long-term government debt, like uh, buying uh, commercial paper, all of which the Federal Reserve has done on a large scale, not large enough to my taste. I think we, I, I would be, love to see the Fed uh, uh, add another $3, billion, $3 trillion to its balance sheet because I think that the, the situation warrants it. Uh, but in any case, we, we certainly have done a fair bit of that. But doing that exposes the central bank to risk. It's one thing if you're holding only treasury bills. You can't lose money on those really unless, unless the world comes to an end. Um, but it's another thing to be holding commercial paper or long-term government debt that can lose its value if interest rates go up and so on. Uh, how can the Fed do that? The answer is, well, it's got an agreement that the U.S. Treasury will, uh, will compensate for any losses. So the Federal Reserve is, is in a way free to be adventurous because it's, it's, uh, it has the, uh, the fiscal authority behind it. Uh, to whom does the ECB turn? 
Who does, if the ECB wants a guarantee from Europe, it's an old line from Henry Kister, right? If I want to talk to Europe on the phone, who do I call? Well, now if we want to talk to European money, you call Jean-Claude Trichet. If you want to talk to European fiscal, it's not so easy, not clear who's on the phone. And so this is turning out to be a problem as well. Um, this might not have been quite so bad if we actually had a, if you had really, really good leadership in the European countries. If we really had a cooperation, if we really had bold leaders uh, who were able to bring their public along with them. Uh, but, you know, any, any system that depends upon having wonderful leaders to work is, is not a good system. And, in fact, they don't. I mean, I don't, I don't think, uh, I, I'm not, uh, I wouldn't assign too much blame to the specific people who are in charge, but it clearly has not been as good uh, as one would have hoped. Uh, according to the New York Times uh, on language blog, uh, there is a new, a new verb in Germany, uh, uh, uh which means to, to bumble through a, a crisis. Um, so uh, it's, there's certainly been, been some of that going on. It's not clear, even, even with the best. I mean, it's, if, even if Angela Merkel were, were a much more inspiring leader than she is, it's not clear that she could have brought the German public with them. Uh, with it. So it, it's, it's, a, uh, um, it's not working well. Um, so I, how does all of this affect uh, the broader world? Again, I don't think there's a lot of spillover in, in economic terms. Uh, the people who think that, that contagion from, uh, from Greece's debt difficulties are going to soon hit everybody that one, any of these days America is going to wake up and discover that we are in the same situation Greece is, uh, I think that's, that's just wrong. Uh, it's, it's missing the specialness of the Greek uh, problems. It's, it's missing the special constraints that they're under. Uh, it's been really striking to me that even uh, the UK, uh, which is in worse fiscal shape than the US, uh, but does have its own currency, is not having any problem at all as far as the markets are concerned. Interest rate on, on British debt is 3.7% is, uh, is last I looked. Not, they're not having a problem. Um, so it, it's not a case that we're going to see this financial crisis spreading. I don't think Greece is the, um, is the harbinger. I don't think Greece is the next Lehman. None of that uh, it seems to be happening. Greece is instead uh, bad news for the Eurozone. Uh, but but um, we need Europe. Uh, there are, for all that we talk about the rise of China and so on, at the moment there are two great economic powers in the world, uh, uh, which is the United States and depending on exactly which aspect of uh, policy we're looking at, either the European Union or the Eurozone. So we need um, uh, world trade policy, the, the two superpowers are the US and the EU, world monetary policy, the two superpowers are the Fed and the ECB. Um, these are, these are both good powers, right? They're both democratic uh, systems that share a lot of values, uh, stand for all of the things that certainly have people like me and I assume almost everybody in this room believe in. Um, but Europe is now kind of self-crippled. They've got a, uh, a monetary experiment, which is not working, uh, which is bringing with it a great deal of political tension. Um, if it starts to fail more spectacularly, which is now at least a reasonably high probability, there's going to be even more political tension. It's going to, there are all these things that happen. The, the um, um, Britain is declining to participate in the, uh, in the bailout fund, uh, which makes perfect sense given that, hey, they, uh, uh, they didn't join the euro and uh, they, they understood at some level that, that there were these problems and yet has got the continental Europeans, has got the Eurozone countries completely furious. Think of that as a small taste of the kind of tensions that now arise within Europe that make Europe poorly positioned to, to play the role it ought to be playing in, in, the, in the wider world. So this is all uh, ugly stuff. It's uh, the talk, that the title I gave for the talk was European Shadows. Um, not so much shadows within Europe, because I think there we're actually at the, uh, 
uh, it, this is not something that might happen, it's something that is happening, but the, the shadow it's casting on, on the whole international system. Um, I think this is the point where I'm supposed to explain what it is I think the Europeans should do. And I'll be damned if I know the answer to that. They really have, they really have created a, a mousetrap for themselves, and the, any way out is going to be extremely painful. Thanks. Be the first one. Yeah. I don't bite. Wait, uh, one thing that always blows my mind when I'm traveling in Europe or the UK is the exchange rate discrepancy. So you have, the UK has worse fiscal problems than the US does, yet it's still a dollar and a half um, to every pound. Everything costs more there. And I just don't understand what's going on. Is that going to rectify itself at some point, or is it just kind of, why does this happen? It's like, it doesn't make sense. To me. Yeah, okay. Um, there, there's, there's a couple of things, um, some of which are uh, some of which are fairly cut and dried, and some of which aren't. So, um, VAT is a is a pretty big part of the story, right? Uh, basically, everything in Europe is paying between a 15 and a 25 percent sales tax, um, which is rebated on exports. So the the price that you pay for a European product doesn't include the VAT, but the price you pay when you're visiting as a tourist, unless you get that back on your purchases at the airport, is, uh, is reflecting. So that's going to make Europe look more expensive. Then there's this other thing, which my entire professional life has been true. For my entire professional life, uh, with the exception of a few brief moments in the mid-1980s and a couple of other times, um, US, all available measures say that U.S. exports should be extremely cost competitive, that we should have lower labor costs and we should, be, uh, we should really be uh, um, beating the Europeans out on, on world export competition. And we never do. We actually always r run trade deficits despite uh, much lower labor costs. The German labor costs compared with U.S. labor costs, they shouldn't be making anything in Germany. And the question, you know, that has to be why, how does that happen? And, and the, the, uh, the, I think people, um, and certainly I end up reverting to amateur sociology, uh, saying that, uh, that Americans are just lousy exporters. Uh, and maybe that's because we basically don't believe the rest of the world exists. And so we just have a hard time, uh, hard time thinking about what, what people who are not Americans might want to buy. Um, so, but whatever the reason, it, this has been true, it's been true forever, basically, since, um, since, well, I was in grad school when, uh, when Bretton Woods broke up and we went to floating exchange rates. And the mark has appeared to the naked eye to be wildly overvalued the entire time. The mark, which became the euro, has appeared to be wildly overvalued the entire time. But German exports have always done better than U.S. exports through that whole period. So whatever it is, it's, it's a constant. And it's, I don't think that this crisis is going to make that go away. Uh, and yes, I drive a German car. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little but, bit. Oh, I think we do request the mics, but all right. They, they, no, see, they, they won't be able to record this. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're, you're pretty uh, positive about the U.S. and what it means or doesn't mean uh, for the U.S. economy, but uh, one thing that's been happening in the markets is corporate, some corporate debt has been actually trading at or below government debt, uh, the, you know, the, the treasuries. So that isn't that something that you know, should concern people, and what are your further thoughts about the U.S. and the situation? Yeah, so the question is, is uh, the, shouldn't we be concerned that some, some corporate debt is, is yeah, basically offering a lower interest rate, or, or some corporate CDSs uh, are cheaper than, than CDSs on U.S. government debt? Um, and what does that mean? And that is, that is pretty wild, right? The, uh, um, actually, I have some problem altogether with the idea of people buying a credit default swap, insuring against, um, against a default by the U.S. government. Because um, think about a world in which the U.S. government defaults. That's, uh, that, that's, that's a 
that's a Mad Max Beyond Thunderdome world, right? That's a world of total, total collapse, chaos. What makes you think that, of all things, credit default swap contracts will be enforced in that world? Uh, and, um, and so I really wonder whether that's you know, exactly what's going on there. But the, uh, um, and, and then you look, I think it was, was it Procter & Gamble, I think? Uh, selling before uh, selling with CDS is cheaper than, than the U.S. governments, which is so we're saying that that basically Western civilization will collapse, but people will still buy soap. I'm not sure, but um, it's a little bit strange. No, but if you actually look, the the uh, the way I would put it is this: the the um, um, that's probably some kind of anomaly in the market that that we don't fully understand. And by the way, last week. Uh, we learned that there's a lot of the markets we don't understand. Uh, thousand point crash in the Dow for, and we still don't know why it happened. But anyway, um, the, um, but the, um, um, I guess I would, the, by the things that you can clearly measure, uh, ability to borrow at quite low interest rates, uh, uh, people are acting as if they still have a reasonable amount of faith in the U.S. government. It's. Uh, um, the, I think today the Treasury auctioned off a bunch of 30-year bonds at so I think 4.29, something like that percent. Um, and you know, committing your money for 30 years uh, is is expressing pretty a lot of faith in, in the durability of, of U.S. solvency. Now it's possible. I, I, we can we can tell stories uh, um, where. Uh, where, where political divisions in the U.S. We, the, our ability to pay the debt, our financial ability to to, uh, to deal with this is, is clear, but our political ability is not so clear, and so that's where that's where the danger lies. And the markets, rightly or wrongly, don't seem to think much of a danger. Yeah. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on the possibility of Greece uh, selling off some of its government assets as a way of reducing its debt. Um, a, is that feasible, and B, if it is feasible, would it help? Jeez, I, I don't, really don't know is the answer. I mean, I, I'm not sure what assets we're talking about here. I, as, uh, well, one of the wilder ideas that's been floating around is selling some islands. Selling some islands. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of volcanoes. Uh, no, or... or um, that's, uh, that would be, I mean, I guess the question would be who is the buyer? I mean, they, one, one thing that, that you do want to realize is even a quite small country uh, where we're talking about uh, you know, $400 billion in, in debt. Uh, and so you have to sell a lot of stuff and who's going to actually buy that, that sort of thing. But, uh, and, you know, my, you know part, of, part of what goes on in today's world makes it different from the, world of the 19th century or the early 20th century is that um, national sovereignty is pretty nearly, it's, it, it's much harder to infringe on national sovereignty than it used to be. It used to be that, that, uh, that essentially on behalf of the creditors, the Europeans or the Americans would send in the gunboats and basically take over and collect the customs revenues. Uh, uh, until the debt had been paid, and you just don't do that now. I think it would be really, really hard to enforce that sort of, of thing now. Uh, I was afraid you were going to talk about privatizing the Acropolis, but anyway, no, let's, I, I, I would oppose that. I mean, if, you know, if it comes to that sort of thing, the truth is, if, if that doesn't buy you anything really that uh, a major debt restructuring wouldn't buy. And if we come, push comes to shove, that's what happens. I mean, it's what would happen with a private individual who was caught in a terrible financial bind. Uh, and countries can do this. I mean, the, uh, um, uh, it's, it, you, it's really hard to, to make the case that the Argentines have been punished severely for their debt repudiation. Um, they're, they're, they're mucking up a bit now but through, through uh, not controlling their policies, but the debt repudiation did not really bring terrible things. They, they basically told the creditors 30 cents on the dollar. And it's my favorite uh, financial headline of the past decade was Reuters, Argentina to creditors, so sue us. Right, what are you gonna do? So I, th I, think, I think that's the, the point is. But the problem, it, just come back, this is not, it, it is not purely a debt problem. That's the point, is that even if you did a major debt restructuring, even if you just crossed the line through that last 140 and made it 70 instead, 
Greece is still a, that's still a terrible outlook for Greece. I wanted to push you a little bit on sort of what should be done and do it through the prism of contrasting logics. You've obviously been in, in big favour of the US stimulus package on what? the grounds yeah. that the world looks much better spending all this money to save the US economy versus when you don't. Do you think the same logic should apply to how the Europeans or indeed the rest of the world treat Greece and that it's better and the other uh, sort of PIG -S economies, it's better to spend a lot of money to save them because the world looks much worse if we don't? Oh, yes, yes. The question is, uh, no, is it, um, we were looking before the, the Greek rescue package, we were looking at a, um, uh, a really scary uh, outlook for the European economy with some spillovers to the rest of us. And yes, to the extent that this is uh, avoiding really drastic um, spending cuts that would have been enforced not just in Greece but in a lot of the rest of Europe, um, this, this, this helps. I mean, the, the, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the reporting claims actually that, that, the, the, which, that the tipping point on the European rescue package was actually a phone call from Obama that, uh, that the United States weighed in and said you really need to do something. I wonder about that. That sounds a little too self-centered on the U.S. Uh, part. But, but I think this is right, that this was better than, than not doing anything, uh, better than just letting the dominoes fall. The problem is it only buys time. The only thing you can say is, I guess, with, we hope that the world economy will be in better shape two or three years from now. Then it, it's, so buying time is not entirely wasted. Uh, but I, what I would really like to see would be a really strong German stimulus package in Germany, which would, which would help us uh, uh, help to start to resolve those imbalances. And of course, I'd like to see the ECB go for quantitative easing uh, and raise its inflation target to 3%. And that would actually offer us some chance of actually getting out of this without a terrible, without the pain being anywhere near as, as bad. But it's not going to happen. Oh, Professor, I, I have a question. Also, when you talk about if the Greek um, government aid you know, have an, a full authority to implement a policy to, um, rec you know, for the economic recovery, they might just devalue their currency, right? Because their currency right now is overvalued. Yeah. And the second, um, and the second um, solution you suggested is to re restructure the debt. But for me, um, if you devalue the currency, yeah. so your debt gonna be exploded. So it's gonna be harder for you to pay off in the future. I think it might be, you know, like a blessing in disguise for Greece that they tie their hands to the, you know, EU, to the Euro, so that um, the currency is fixed right now. But then now they have to like implement, like, you know, try to do some other policy to make sure that the real values of the products in that country are in, in line with, you know, the productivity of that country. Oh gosh, um, if I understood that, it's saying that, 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 that the advantage of, of this kind of Crisis with with no with no uh, even halfway uh, easy way out is that it forces you to make big reforms. Um, I don't think that the the record actually says that that's what happens. I mean, if you look at uh, um, uh, what can I say? Think think about Argentina in the late '90s, with clearly massively overvalued peso, uh, terrible unemployment, terribly, uh, there was a lots of talk about reform, but you know, nothing ever really happened. And the other hand, think about, actually to give an example that's a, a more positive one, um, Mexico had its, uh, its financial crisis in 1995 um, and devalued. And uh, they did not, the story of Mexican reform is not, a, is not an entirely happy one. Lots of reform, lots of increased exports, not so much growth. Uh, but what's certainly true is that they did not stop or go back on those reforms uh, because they had the, the safety valve of devaluation. Uh, on the contrary, they, they maintained them and they probably would not have been able to maintain them if they hadn't been able to, to have a big export recovery thanks to the devaluation. So I don't think, uh, let's, but I, I think you, you would have to straight you have to search um, very, very hard to find any silver lining in this. I think you would, uh, 
it, it requires a, a, a depth of optimism that I can't find to, to see anything good in what's happening to Greece. Like, can yeah. I follow up yeah. a little bit? Um, you know, just like, because now the, the Greek currency is the euro, right? So they right. cannot change the currency, right. they cannot devalue. But um, they try to improve their like, current account, right? But um, you know, one of the solution is to devalue the currency, but now you don't have that option. It's like, what, what can they do then? Well, deflation. I mean, you could have more, you know, internal devaluation, as they say. You know, cut your wages, cut your prices. You know, uh, uh, in the long run, that will achieve the same thing. And that's exactly the context in which John Maynard Keynes said, in the long run, we are all dead, right? I mean, that's, uh, that's the point, yes. And give, give them 10 years of mass unemployment and grinding deflation, and they will be competitive again. But that's good for the export, but not good for the import, that they still... No, it helps the imports, too. Import the stuff gets cheaper. It'll, 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 but, you know, I, I just, I, it's just terrible. It's just a terrible, terrible thing. We are, we are replaying this, when John Maynard Keynes wrote The Economic Consequences of Mr. Churchill about the terrible things that were being done to Britain to defend the gold standard in the 20s, um, um, that was trivial compared to what Greece is now being expected to do. It's a really horrible, horrible uh, ringer that they're being put through and, uh, um, and I just, just says that, the, that the, the policies that brought them to, to this point, which are policies only slightly the policies of Greece, but mostly policies of the European uh, the economy as a whole, were a terrible mistake. Well, I assume this table comes from the IMF. Yes. There is a line missing from it, as far as I can tell. There is nothing there which describes the projected course of GDP in Greece. Further up this table. with this, these numbers. And I, I'm wondering whether you think, I don't know what the underlying assumption is, that it's remotely possible that one could cut 12.6% at the peak of GDP from the public sector combination of tax increases yeah. and spending uh, cuts without having a dramatic effect on GDP itself and whether it's remotely possible that that effect was built in to the GDP forecast under which all of these other, in which all these other numbers are based. Yeah, so, uh, I, I agree with you. You're, uh, you're right. I mean, there, there, there probably isn't really a multiplier effect built into the forecast. The forecast is grim. The forecast is for basically no growth. Um, you know, for shrinkage this year, further shrinkage next year, and then barely any growth in the several following years. But given that scale of fiscal contraction, it's probably not nearly grim enough. The forecast is also for essentially zero price increase when I think the reality is that, that it's, a, it's a policy that, that points to large-scale deflation. So yeah, that, that far lower right number should probably be 160, not 140. So is, it, is anyone at the IMF raising this issue? Or I'm sure that they are, but not publicly. You know, it's this, it's this funny thing, and this is really, look, you know, and I, the, the chief economist at the IMF, uh, you may not agree with him politically, but Olivier Blanchard is, Definitely nobody's fool, and he's, and he's basically got a Keynesian view of the world, and I'm sure that, uh, that, that in private conversation, I don't know this, but I'm sure, or at least, at least in what he says to himself in the middle of the night, he understands all of this perfectly well, but you can't say that now. So, uh, Could we get the SEC to do for this what they just did for Goldman Sachs? Uh, that's an interesting question. Does it go under, yeah. No, I, but you know, I think what's happening here is it's sort of everyone is trapped by the, the expectations. We, we cannot talk about uh, leaving the euro. It, the, the, uh, no one, you know, if I held even a, 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 a toehold on an official position, I could not talk about it. Uh, because to do it would be basically inviting bank runs. And so you can't talk about it. Um, and, um, and then if you can't talk about that, you're forced to talk about almost inconceivable fiscal austerity. And to talk about that, you have to kind of pretend that it's not going to inflict as much economic harm as it actually is. And uh, yeah, it, it's, it's the kind of thing, it's the kind of situation that, that sort of makes liar, liars of everybody, uh, which is, I guess, one further consequence. There's a, there's a kind of uh, unexpected moral, moral hazard in, in this. Uh, uh, not, not in the economic sense, but a, but a moral dimension. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, there's this, 
it, it's uh, uh, the pretense goes on. You know, I guess everyone is just sort of, realistically, I think they're just hoping that something turns up, though it's hard to see what that can be. Um, yeah. I was wondering if you could talk about how this affects the long-term viability of the European Union, and in particular, how the public feels about it, given that some of the integration attempts have been very elite-driven, if this is affecting yeah. elite calculations or the public. Yeah, wow. Um, so the European Union, the, the, you know, the, the, the customs union um, has worked fine, worked smoothly. The European Union as, a, as an agent in world trade negotiations has worked fine. Um, the, I think part of this is that they, the, part of what, the problem is that the European elite has had a kind of bicycle theory of European uh, integration. Uh, you know, that's the, the famous theory in, in trade negotiations that you, you have to keep moving forward or, or, the, or you fall over. And so having achieved 1992, having gotten the Single European Act and all that, they, they felt, well, we have to have something, there has to be something next, and so they looked for this, and instead they got something that doesn't work. Now whether, I guess this is where you find out whether the bicycle theory is true, right? If this doesn't work, does that actually lead to undermining the progress that has already been made on other fronts? Um, I would guess probably not, but God knows. And uh, it's, you know, this, the European project has always been, people here I'm sure know this far better than I do, you know, but it's always been this, this uh, slightly tricky venture without a lot of mass public support, with the elites looking for stuff and you know the, uh, um, and and uh, and based a lot on on things left unsaid or things left uh, uh, said only by implication. Right? It, I've, I've always enjoyed talking to to bureaucrats because they're they're very smart and never say explicitly what they mean. It's it's really like like being through being through a uh, uh, being through an episode of Yes Minister every time you're in Brussels. And it's uh, uh, and you know so they, well, you know what you feel like there should be subtitles with what they're actually saying. So you'll have this urbane guy talking at, at some length about widening versus deepening. This is actually before the current crisis, and then you finally realize that what he's really saying is we should never have let the Greeks in. Uh, and, uh, um, and yeah, but, but no, this is a real problem. I mean, the, 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 um, the single currency was, I mean, they, they pulled it off spectacularly up until this point, but now, now it's a real problem. And I, I don't know how it works. And, and yeah, and, um, and right, you can see, you can see that, right, the, the uh, uh, if you like, the, the election in North Rhine Westphalia was, was, uh, was where the, this collision shows up in, in actual uh, political reality. Actually, to follow up on that, uh, when the Greek crisis initially broke out, one of, the one of the ideas that was floated in Europe was the creation of a European monetary fund. So do you right. think it makes any economic sense or it makes any political sense? Well, because they just did, right? In effect, de facto, they just created a, a fund which is, is huge. Uh, it's, it's sort of being, it's kind of funny thing. They're, they're, I mean that this the European what is it now? It's called the European Stability Mechanism. Is that what I, there's a phrase for? I've, I've forgotten what they've uh, they've already come up with a, a three-letter you know something or other for it. And um, and in effect, it is. That's what it is. In effect, it's a it's a European Monetary Fund um, with the existing IMF de facto serving as the secretariat for this thing. So they the, they have the the the, the IMF proper. Um, doing the, uh, you know, setting the conditionality and, and, and doing the projections. Uh, but the money is, is coming from, the bulk of it is coming from the European thing. The trouble is that, you know, the IMF, or now this, this new sort of super IMF within Europe, it can only do certain things. It can provide you with funding to get through medium term uh, funding difficulties but it can't by itself impose or, or allow, uh, you know, create adjustments. Uh, the IMF in the past has been able to, uh, you know, it, it can bridge you through a problem, can help you to, uh, uh, to make the adjustments you need, but if there's no mechanism for the adjustments, then, then uh, uh, it doesn't help any. So, sure, I mean, the IMF can come in and, uh, you can actually ask how much good they did, but the IMF can come in and provide funding to South Korea 
Um, but uh, if you can't do what the South Koreans did and, and have a massive devaluation of the won, which gives them a gigantic export surge, then, uh, then the funding doesn't do that much good. So, I mean, uh, it all comes, I mean, different people have different perspectives, but as I see it, that this, this isn't fundamentally about fiscal policy, and it isn't fundamentally about short-term funding. Uh, it's, it's fundamentally about the lack of an adjustment mechanism when costs have, and prices have gotten out of line by having a single currency that, uh, without really having the appropriate uh, preconditions for a single currency. I, two years ago, when the crisis really hit the United States, you could argue that the U.S. had lost, you know, one of the, the comments that went around a lot was that the U.S. had lost its ability to lead, that its model proved so bankrupt that, you know, it would uh, lose its sort of hegemonic position in, in organizations. And I take your final point being that, you know, if Europe has this crisis, it's a real problem. To what extent can they actually advocate for their cause in places like the G20 and so forth. I guess my question is how long, in the long term, how crippling do you think this is going to be for the European project going forward, both internally and also their ability to try to influence larger global governance structures? Wow. You know, there, I'm a big opponent of, of um, holistic views of systems here. Uh, you say there's an American model and there's a European model and now, the, the American model, no, but people, people, I mean, it's you say it, but people say that, right? But, um, um, you know, I, if I, I, in my ideal world, I think we have, uh, we have French healthcare and uh, an American monetary policy and, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, you, you can pick and choose. It's not, it's not the, the European social insurance system has been a tremendous asset in this crisis. Right? The, the, um, the, the human cost of the slum has been far less in Europe than it has in the United States. You look at the GDP numbers for Germany and the US and you say they're comparable recessions. You ask about how much, how many lives have been destroyed by the crisis and there's no comparison. So those things have worked. You know, only in the United States have, do people lose their health care when, when there's an economic crisis. But monetary policy, although uh, I would have wanted a much more aggressive response than we've actually had. The United States has done better. We, uh, and uh, so it, it's not all of a piece. And I hope that people can make those distinctions, that they don't say, oh, well, uh, although they're, of course they're trying. You know, people are, in fact, like I said at the beginning, people are trying to appropriate the, uh, they basically are saying Greece is in trouble, therefore we have to privatize Social Security, is sort of the logic that they're making. It does, that, but that's not, these are, this is a monetary failure. And, and it's kind of characteristic. The, if you actually, it's always been, uh, particularly with Germany, it's always been remarkable to how the Germans combine a highly regulated uh, a, a view of the economy as needing enormous amounts of microeconomic regulation uh, to the point where when I'm in Germany, I become an ugly American saying, you know, why can't the stores be open more hours? Uh, um, while at the same time having this sort of puritanical Victorian view of monetary policy, uh, which, which uh, which is, is really where the problem is here. I, I'm sorry, follow-up question, slightly unrelated. You said now that you think there's a better likelihood that Greece might actually fall out of the euro, that you thought before that it would have been inconceivable that if there are enough bank runs, that might actually happen. My question is, follow that line of logic a little more, which is, if Greece actually does pull out, what happens to the other you know, the cohesion countries that you talked about. Right. Be, that's, the, that's the reason why no one can tell, right? If Greece drops out, then there will be immediate speculation that Portugal and Spain and possibly Italy, although Italy has been amazingly unaffected so far, uh, will, will drop out. And, uh, and that will require either uh, a lot of emergency measures or uh, or it could, it could, it could be dominance, right? Uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, nobody knows how that plays out, but it could happen. That's, that's, that's one reason why everyone's doing it, right? It, it's, uh, because as long, right now, the, well, or, I don't know what it is right now, but a month ago, the view that everyone held was that it, it's impossible to leave the euro, so you just didn't worry about it. And, uh, and if, if someone does, then 
that opens up a whole lot more possibility for, for speculation. So yeah, I'm, I'm wondering when the, uh, when the sovereign bank uh, over on Nassau Street uh, takes down the signs that boast that it's part of one of the world's strongest banks, Santander. Uh, which is not a comment actually on Santander, of which I know nothing, but just that, you know, runs on Spanish banks are something you could imagine happening one of these, one of these days. Can I just ask a question? Yeah. Uh, just, um, Paul, uh, I wanted to ask you to say a little bit more about the implications for, for uh, what's happening in Europe for the U.S. and the world economy. Uh, you, yeah. Your argument so far has been that it's going to create a, a more unsettled Europe. It's obviously slower growth political conflict within Europe, um, that will have implications for the U.S. and the partnership with Europe, as you said at the end of your talk. Is this a, how bad could it get for the world economy growth level, and uh, what would, what should Washington be worrying about, as it looks at, aside from the, the human costs that we see unfolding in, in Greece and the surrounding area? What, what are the systemic implications of the risk? All right, this could be famous last words, but I think not too bad. I mean, first of all, we can, we can imagine a breakup of the Eurozone, although probably not all of it. So Greece, and then there could be problems elsewhere, but, but that's not, um, not clear to me that that has too much backwash effect on Germany or France. Maybe it's not even clear how bad it is for Italy, which is, as I said, been almost bizarrely durable in this, in this crisis. Um, so even the impact on European growth, although it's not good, is probably, this is not, this is not a freeze up of financial markets that we're looking at, like, like what happened in 2008. Um, for the US, um, the direct, so we export, I should not have this number in my head, but it's less than 3% of our GDP to Europe. So if we're actually asking, you know, how much, how much does, European economic troubles have a direct impact on the U.S., not so much. Actually, the weaker Euro uh, is probably a bigger concern in reducing U.S. exports than, the, uh, the, than, than any contraction in the European economy, although the weaker Euro is actually good for the Europeans. So, so when you look at the, uh, at the slide in the Euro, you should be basically saying, oh, that's a cushioning factor for the Europeans and a problem for us. Um, rest of the world, hard to see what, yes, the Asians, uh, ship, you know, a lot of stuff to Europe, uh, but again, uh, um, it might actually be bigger in its impact there than on the U.S., uh, but I, I don't think, I, I guess I'm not seeing this as turning into a global economic crisis, or I should put, I should put the accent differently, I'm not seeing this turning into a global economic crisis, it's, it's not good, but I think the main thing is just the, the destructive effect on on one of those players that, uh, that we count on to be a stabilizing impact on the whole world system. So, uh, Professor, in the recent uh, support plan, uh, the European leaders were pretty explicit that this is not going to monetize debt and how extra liquidity is going to be absorbed. But on one hand, you know, Europe, uh, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal are in trouble and they can't support such a strong currency. On the other hand, Germany is kind of a net exporter. So why wouldn't just the ECB say, you know, we're monetizing debt, we're going to devalue the euro? It isn't it a win-win situation for Europe? Sorry, they're going to monetize the debt and what? No, so wouldn't devaluing, wouldn't the ECB saying we're going to devalue the euro be a win-win situation? Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they should be monetizing the debt, some of it. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is, um, I've been trying to tell people this for, really since the crisis began, that we are now, uh, for, for the time being, we're in uh, Alice through the looking glass territory economically, where, where virtue is vice and, and uh, uh, where, where, where uh, um, the credibility of the central bank as an inflation fighter is actually a, a real liability. And so we, we would, uh, I would hope that they will monetize the debt. I mean, what a lot of us are hoping actually is that, that of course, the, the ECB has to say that they are in no way ever going to monetize the debt, partly because uh, I guess they're officially the rules say that they can't, but that in practice what they're going to be doing is, is, is in fact doing just that. Uh, so yeah, I mean the, the best hope is that, is that what we are looking at is something that is uh, basically a, a quantitative easing involving purchases of, of long-term government debt in the Eurozone that uh, from the point of view of the broader European economy is exactly what the doctor ordered. And yes, would weaken the euro. And 
nothing. I mean, if the euro falls to parity, as I guess uh, some people are saying, that would be, that might, you know, all, all my pessimism might go away. That would probably solve all their problems. It would be hell for us, but it would uh, be great for them. And, uh, just, just to follow up on that, how could the ECB or the Eurozone do that without causing you know, high inflation and creating another bubble pretty much? Why would there be high inflation when there's still massive unemployed labor, unemployed resources? And that's, a, that's, a, that's the whole thing. You look at, people look at the, at the US set case. They look at the Federal Reserve and they say, oh, look at the expansion of its balance sheet. Look at the increase of the monetary base. Hyperinflation is just around the corner, but that's not the way things work when you're in a up against the when you're in a liquidity trap. Uh, you know, Japan, if you if follow, apply the same same um, considerations to Japanese monetary policy between uh, 1998 when they started quantitative easing and basically forever. And uh, by those calculations, they should have had an explosion in prices in Japan. And the fact is, they've never escaped deflation. So expansion and integration with Russia. I have no idea, uh, I think is the short answer. I mean, you know, Russia is, um, Russia is an even weirder player, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's still a nuclear superpower, a lot of natural resources, but not that big an economy. And um, uh, big source of seniorage for the Europeans. Uh, but basically, um, they, Russia has become to Europe what Latin America is to us. It's, place that you export large numbers of hundred, hundred dollar or hundred euro bills used for purposes best not described uh, and uh, uh, in effect it's zero interest loans that you receive. But uh, no, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think it makes that much difference. Um, I, I, I guess I can't see that it's, it's, uh, it's that big an issue. Well, on that note, I will you join me in thanking you.